Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 9 is titled Beware of Covetousness and is read in preparation for teaching on Sabbath March 4, Sabbath afternoon, February 25. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet. And as we open your word this week, we just want to thank you that you give us guidance. You also give us the story of salvation. You also tell us that Jesus is coming again soon. And as we study this series of lessons on our responsibility toward you, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. As this week, we look at covetousness and how it can affect us and what our response needs to be. We pray that we may accept your will for our own personal lives. And Lord, I'd like to pray today for the family of each person who is listening uh, to this podcast. As they listen to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson, may it be a blessing to them personally, to their family and to their community. And I'd like to pray in particular for those who are listening in Palmerston North in New Zealand and Dubbo in New South Wales and Twiggy Wills in Zambia and Herminia in Guam and Caro in Argentina and Monica in St Vincent and Mathiro in Malawi and others who are listening in these places, Lord, and Pat in East Tennessee and Emma in Lubbock in Texas and Kay in the Cayman Islands, and Marsha in Bermuda, and Killy in Nairobi, Nairobi, sorry, I got that wrong, Lord, and Kenya. Wherever people are listening, whether it be in Europe or the Middle East or Asia, Lord, in South America, in North America, in Africa, wherever we are, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be there to bless us and guide us. And may we know that not only are you the God who created us, but the God who is saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our memory text this week is Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things we possess. Let's read that again, Luke 12 verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Covetousness has been defined as an inordinate desire for wealth or possessions that really don't belong to you. Covetousness is a big deal, big enough in fact to be right up there with not lying, stealing or murder. It's so damaging that God chose to warn against it in his great moral law. In Exodus 20 verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. Covetousness is frequently listed with heinous sins that will keep one out of the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 we read, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Covetousness, right up there with extortion, idolatry, fornication, and adultery, that's what the texts say. And this week, we will look at examples of just how bad it is and what we can do to overcome it. Sunday, February 26, The Ultimate Original Sin The question often arises, and understandably so, about how sin arose in God's universe. We understand how, at least somewhat. And at its heart, it was because of covetousness. Perhaps covetousness, then, is the ultimate original sin. Read Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. What hints are given there about the fall of Lucifer? How did covetousness play a crucial role in that fall? 
Isaiah 14, beginning at verse 12. How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Not content with his position, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35, though honoured above the heavenly host, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings, it was his endeavour to secure their service and loyalty to himself and coveting the glory with which the infinite father had invested his son this prince of angels aspired to power that was the prerogative of christ alone End of quote. read ephesians chapter 5 verse 5 and colossians 3 verse 5 with what does paul equate covetousness and why Ephesians 5 verse 5 For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And Colossians 3 verse 5 Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. How fascinating that twice Paul would equate covetousness with idolatry. People practice idolatry when they worship, that is, dedicate their lives to something other than God, something created rather than the Creator, as we read in Romans 1.25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Could covetousness then wanting something that we shouldn't have and wanting it so badly that our desire for it rather than the lord becomes the focus of our heart no doubt lucifer at first didn't know where his wrong desires were to lead him it can be the same with us the commandment against covetousness the one commandment that deals only with thoughts can stop us from acts that will lead to the violation of other commandments as well. See, for instance, 2 Samuel chapter 11. And that's the story of David, Bathsheba and Uriah. Let's read the whole story. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and beginning at verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired after the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she went and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. 
Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on the bed with his servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, and he wrote in the letter, saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the Horus battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. So it was, when Joab besieged the city, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they should shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jebusheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall, so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's men are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And so to finish today, read 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 6 and 7. How can focusing on what Paul writes here help protect us from covetousness? So 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7 reads, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will carry nothing out. Monday, February 27, an accursed thing in the camp. It was arguably one of the grandest times in the history of Israel. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they were finally entering the promised land. Through a dramatic miracle, the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River at its flood stage on dry land. This dry land crossing was so impressive that the hearts of the heathen kings in Canaan melted and they had no spirit to fight, as we read in Joshua 5 verse 1. So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. The first real challenge in the conquest of Canaan was the walled and fortified city of Jericho. No one knew what to do to defeat the inhabitants of Jericho, not even Joshua. In answer to Joshua's prayer, God revealed the plan for the destruction of the city, which they followed. But then 
things took a decidedly bad turn. Read Joshua chapter 7, what happened after the powerful victory at Jericho, and what message should we take from this story for ourselves. Joshua 7, beginning at verse 1, But the children of Israel committed a trespass against the accursed things. For Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth-Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about thirty-six men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all, to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O Lord, What shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you any more unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes." And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So, Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zahites, and he brought the family of the Zahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken." Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing fifty shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent, with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. 
Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Once confronted, Achor admitted what he did, saying that he had coveted those goods. The Hebrew word here translated coveted, chi C-H-M-D, there's no vowels, just the letters C-H-M-D, has been used in some places in the Bible in a very positive sense. The same root appears in Daniel 9.23, for instance, when Gabriel told Daniel that he was a man greatly beloved. Let's read Daniel 9.23. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. In this case, however, this CHMD was bad news. Despite the clear command not to pillage from the captured cities, Achan did just that, bringing disrepute upon the whole nation. Joshua 6, verses 18 and 19, and you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. In fact, after the defeat of Ai, Joshua feared that as it says in Joshua 7, 9, the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? In other words, the Lord wanted to use these great victories as part of letting the surrounding nations know of his power and his work among his own people. Their conquests were to be, in a different sort of way, a witness to the nations of Yahweh's power. Of course, after the fiasco at Ai, besides the loss of human life, that witness had been compromised. And so to finish the day, think about how easily Achan could have justified his actions. Well, it's such a small amount compared to all the rest of the booty. No one will know, and what can it hurt? Besides, my family needs the money. How can we protect ourselves from this kind of dangerous rationalisation? Tuesday, February 28, The Heart of Judas One of the most tragic stories in the Bible is that of Judas Iscariot. This man had a privilege that only 11 other people in all history of the world have had to have been with Jesus all that time, and to have learned eternal truths directly from the Master himself. How sad that many people who never had anything remotely like the opportunities that Judas had will be saved, while Judas, we know, is now destined for eternal destruction. What happened? The answer can be found in one word, covetousness, the desires of the heart. Read John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. What did Mary do that attracted so much attention during the feast? How did Judas react? Why? What was Jesus' response? John 12, beginning at verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, 
who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone, for she has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. The Saviour's gentle rebuke to Judas's covetous remark led him to leave the feast and go directly to the palace of the high priest where Jesus' enemies were gathered. He offered to betray Jesus into their hands for a sum of much smaller than Mary's gift, as we read in Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. What happened to Judas? Having had so many wonderful opportunities, so many rare privileges, why would he do something so evil? According to Ellen G. White, writing in The Desire of Ages, page 716, Judas loved the great teacher and desired to be with him. He felt a desire to be changed in character and life, and he hoped to experience this through connecting himself with Jesus. The Saviour did not repulse Judas, he gave him a place among the twelve. He trusted him to do the work of an evangelist. He endowed him with power to heal the sick and to cast out devils. But Judas did not come to the point of surrendering himself fully to Christ. End of quote. In the end, we all have character defects that, if surrendered, can be overcome through the power of God working in us. But Judas did not fully surrender to Christ, and the sin of covetousness, which he could have overcome in the power of Christ, overcame him instead, with tragic results. Who among us doesn't struggle with covetousness over one thing or another? In this case, what he coveted was money, and that covetousness, a problem of the heart, led him to stealing, as we read in John 12 verse 6, which ultimately led him to betray Jesus. What a frightful lesson for all of us about the danger that covetousness can bring. What seems like a small thing, a simple desire of the heart, can lead to calamity and to eternal loss. Wednesday, March 1, Ananias and Sapphira. It was an exciting time to be a member of the church. Following the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the apostles were preaching the gospel with power and thousands were joining the church. We read in Acts chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common." What a privilege Ananias and Savara had being part of the early church, seeing it grow and seeing the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in such a marked manner. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, we read in verses 34 and 35. For all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. It was in this setting that Ananias and Sapphira, obviously impressed by what was happening and wanting to be part of it, decided to sell some property and contribute the proceeds to the church. So far, so good. Read Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. What do you think was worse, holding back part of the money or lying about it? Why such a harsh punishment? Acts chapter 5, let's begin at verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. 
But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and kept back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, Now is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then, immediately, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. At first it seemed as if they were sincere in their desire to give toward the work. However, afterward Ananias and Sapphira grieved the Holy Spirit by yielding to feelings of covetousness, Ellen White writes in the Acts of the Apostles, page 72. The quote continues, They began to regret their promise and soon lost the sweet influence of the blessing that had warmed their hearts with the desire to do large things in behalf of the cause of Christ. End of quote. In other words, though they had started out with the best of motives, their covetousness caused them to put on a front and pretend to be what they really weren't. And so to finish today, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things, we read in verse 11. After this incident, people surely must have been more careful in returning their tithe. But this sad account was not included in the Bible as a warning against faithfulness in tithing. Instead, what does it teach us about where covetousness can lead? Thursday, March 2. Overcoming Covetousness Covetousness is a matter of the heart and, like pride and selfishness, often goes unnoticed, which is why it can be so deadly and deceiving. It's hard enough overcoming sins that are obvious, lying, adultery, stealing, idolatry, Sabbath-breaking, but these are outward acts, things that we have to think about before we do them. But to overcome wrong thoughts themselves? That gets tough. Read 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. What promise is given here, and why is this so important to understand in the context of covetousness? 1 Corinthians 10.13 No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. How then, in God's power, can we be protected against this dangerously deceptive sin? 1. Make a decision to serve and depend on God and to be part of his family, as we read in Joshua 24.15. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 2. Be daily in prayer, and include Matthew 6.13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. When feeling covetous of something that you know you should not have, pray over it, claiming promises in the Bible for victory, such as 1 Corinthians 10.13, which we've just read, but let's do it again. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 3. Be regular in Bible study. Psalm 119 verse 11 reads, Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. 
Jesus tackled the human sin problem. He was tempted on every point that we are tempted on, and for power to resist, he spent whole nights in prayerful communion with his Father. And Jesus didn't leave this earth until he had both forged the way by example and then promised power to make it possible for every person to live a life of faith and obedience, to develop a Christ-like character. Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7 reads, Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And so to finish the day, what, if any, have been the consequences in your own life from covetousness? What lessons have you learned? What might you still need to learn from them? Friday, March 3. In the conquest of Jericho, Achan was not the only man carrying silver and gold back to the camp of Israel. Joshua had told the men to bring back the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron to the treasury of the house of God, as you read in Joshua 6, verses 19 and 24. Verse 19, But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And verse 24, But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Everything else was to be burned. Achan, however, was the only man to keep something for himself. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 496, Of the millions of Israel, there was but one man who, in that solemn hour of triumph and judgment, had dared to transgress the command of God. Achan's covetousness was excited by the sight of that costly robe of Shinar. Even when it had brought him face to face with death, he called it a goodly Babylonian garment. One sin can lead to another, and he appropriated the gold and silver devoted to the treasury of the Lord. He robbed God of the first fruits of the land of Canaan. End of quote. In Paul's list of signs of the last days, the first two items involve our attitude toward money and possessions. But know this, he writes in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money or covetous. Selfishness and love of money are significant descriptions of humanity in the last days, our day. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Read 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 10. Now godliness and contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In class, talk about examples of those who, because of the love of money, have pierced themselves and others through with many sorrows. There are lots of examples, aren't there? How can we find the right balance knowing that we need money to get by but not falling into the trap Paul warns about here. 2. What are other things beside money that we can covet? 3. What is the difference between a legitimate desire for something and covetousness? When might a legitimate desire for something turn into covetousness? And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Boldly Sharing Jesus by Andrew McChesney 
On an Easter Sunday, retired pastor Simo Vekavuri stood in a packed train travelling home to the capital, Helsinki, from evangelistic meetings that he had conducted in central Finland. A 24-year-old university student boarded the train and looked around for a seat. Even though the train looks full, why don't you walk through the cars and see whether you can find an empty seat, Simo said to her. She returned smiling. I found two free seats, she said, one for me and one for you. Come with me. The two sat opposite each other. Excuse me, but do you mind if I ask you how you feel about religion, Simo asked. I'm quite far from spiritual things right now, she said. Would you like to know how I became a believer, Simo asked. She did, and Simo told her. As the train approached Helsinki, he said, Would you mind if I remembered you in my prayers? The student burst into tears. The tears flowed down her cheeks, and she said loudly, That would be really great. Please do that. Before parting ways, Simo said something that he often tells new friends. May you be encouraged to know that even though you are very busy, you can serve a risen Jesus Christ, the one who atoned for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And that's not all. This same Jesus has promised to come back and will take us to a heavenly home where eternity will start. So, dear friend, let us stay on the heaven-bound journey under the Father's loving hand until we reach our destination. May the Lord bless you through his grace. On another train trip, Simo was surprised when a woman greeted him and even shook his hand as he boarded. Hello, I'm a retired Seventh-day Adventist pastor, he replied. Well, that's interesting, the woman said. I have never heard about Adventists. I want to hear all about your church on this 500 kilometre or 300 mile trip. Here were two empty seats. Let's sit together. Simo spoke about the Adventist church for the whole trip. As they left the train, a man walked up behind him. Thank you for the interesting train ride, he said, eagerly grabbing Simo's hand with both of his hands. Thank you for being so brave to share God so loudly that all of us could hear. At 84, Simo seeks divine appointments on every train. The older I get, the bolder I get in sharing Jesus, he said. This mission story illustrates spiritual growth objective number five of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. Read more on IWillGo2020.org. Read more about Simo next week. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.